Levy. Um, and at the moment, we are missing Suzanne Smith. Um, we also mm -hmm. have Meredith O'Leary from the Department of Health and Kelly Constantine. Um, so we'll start the evening um, with um, uh, community comments. If you would like to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, we're going to ask that you raise your hand using the little reaction button down in the bottom of your Zoom link. Um, and if you can, please limit your comments to something new that others have not said, just in the interest of time. Um, if, uh, if it gets really late, <laughs> uh, we may need to limit comments to shorter than three minutes. Um, so we appreciate um, um, everyone who would like to speak. And we'd like to give everybody a chance to make their views heard. Um, so uh, if anyone is here for public comment, also please state your name. Um, and uh, Kelly, what else do you need? you need an address? I don't think so. Um, OK. And um, please wait till you are called upon and you will be unmuted. Um, for your Morgan time. is the first. I'm just going to go right down my list when okay. I see hands. So um, Morgan, you're first, and then I'm going to ask you to unmute. And, Cynth and Cynthia will be timing you and give you a gentle um, reminder if your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, my name is Morgan Sheehan, and I'm representing Team Link, which is a martial arts school in Northampton. And um, we'd love to know when the ban on cohorts for martial arts schools will be lifted. It's been three months since we've moved away from mass cohorts. And we understand absolutely that the ban was put in place primarily for children's contact sports. Um, but we'd like to note that after the ban, the numbers increased. And we're assuming that's because much like Dr. Fauci said, the primary transmission is in-home events in the holidays. Now that cases have gone down, they're about the same levels that they were before the ban was in place. Um, it's having a pretty negative impact on our business, particularly because the Northampton ban is different from everywhere else in the state. So our customers are asking why we're being treated differently than other gyms and um, when we'll be treated the same as gyms across the state. Um, members are canceling um, and we're having um, difficulty getting answers to our questions when we call or email which is why we brought it to a public forum. Um, we, we really don't wanna be the next business in Northampton that closes because of COVID and having a clear metric or a timeline for when um, the decision will be made about reversing the ban would be really helpful for us in terms of customer retention. So just some notes, about a third of our members have already received the vaccine. And because there wasn't a correlation between case numbers associated with the ban, we don't necessarily see that the ban has had a positive effect. But we'd love to know again, just that clarity. Um, is the ban time limited? Is it based on percentage of new cases or test positivity rates? So Northampton is the only town in the state that has continued this ban where elsewhere it was time limited. So primarily we're asking for clarity about the ban on contact for mass cohorts in martial arts schools. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. I'm gonna lower your hand. Um, the next is Jacob. Hello, I am Jacob Furtar representing Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School football team. I have um, done a presentation earlier, well, made a presentation on, how, on why football and uh, high school sports are important to us and we like a, that we would like a season. So um, high school sports is about building friendships, finding strength and leadership. But we're not going to achieve the rest without teamwork, which is the most important of all. Building friendships is important. Jacob, we can't hear you for some reason. Jacob, we can't hear you. Teamwork is important because it, with all things above things, we cannot get the goals done. These are life lessons and challenges that will help future endeavors 
to come within similar environments and certain jobs. Um, we should have a season because we it gives us opportunity to change for the year for not just one person, but as a whole team, make a difference, have a good season. Playing together maybe for the first time or maybe their last. Um, also, this is the last year for some uh, students in our um, team because they have, they're going to go to a different school or they're just going to move on. Um, and they really like the opportunity to have a season. And also we'd like to thank um, the North Carolina Board of Health for an opportunity for letting us speak. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Is there anyone else that, okay, I see Rachel. Uh, okay. Rachel? Yes. There you go, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Janet Capello. I am a parent of one of the children at Smith Vogue who is um, petitioning to allow a football season to um, continue. The MIAA has approved a, what they, they're calling fall two for um, all of Massachusetts. The final ban, the final hurdle would be um, for the city of Northampton to allow these children to play. So um, I prepared just a couple notes that I put down this morning. Um, it shouldn't take too long. Um, so I'm a paramedic firefighter. Uh, I've dealt almost exclusively with COVID for the past year um, or COVID related illness, as well as other life threats or um, reasons to call the ambulance. But primarily we've been dealing with COVID. Um, I could say unequivocally that I have not had one child with COVID, not one teenager with COVID or COVID-like symptoms. Um, even those anecdotal evidence, I feel as though it serves as a reference um, at the very least as to whether this is a true health threat or um, threat to public safety or the wellness of our high school student athletes. Uh, these kids have lost everything in the last year. I mean, who hasn't? COVID has touched every single person in attendance at this meeting tonight. And we've all made sacrifices um, and some of our loved ones have paid the ultimate price. But we as adults um, and as a community and health professionals and parents can make an impact in the life, lives of these kids. These boys and girls just wanna play football. They've had to adhere to a certain code of conduct to even be on the team. They have to have not only passing grades, but good grades. They also have to stay drug, alcohol, and tobacco free, and they have to stay in top physical performance. With the gyms being closed for the better part of the last year, this means that these children have had to adapt and become inventive and self-disciplined and hold themselves accountable for their workout regimen at home. And they have. With all the hopes just that they could play and just be kids again, just one last time, especially for our seniors. With depression, drug use, and suicide rates for youth skyrocketing nationally um, and never seen at these rates, I feel like taking the way, taking away sports or their opportunity to play sports is egregiously wrong. Um, my child is coming from a totally vaccinated household. I know a lot of children are coming from a totally vaccinated household as well. Um, on top of helmets, face shields, they will also be required to wear masks. Um, this season will be during the coldest months, even with the frozen ground and snow and all of their normal gear, they're still willing to play. They want this more than anything. Um, some of these kids, as I stated before, are seniors, and this would have only been the second time in franchise history for Smith Vogue um, Vikings football. Rachel, I'm, I'm sorry if you could just finish your thought. Your time is up. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, with that being said, I was just trying to say, and that was three minutes? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize yeah. that I was that no long worries. with it tonight. No, no, um, no, no problem. So just in closing, I just want to say, like, we should really allow these children to be able to play, especially the senior prom is gone. Um, graduation is gone. This is their one last time to be kids. These are tradesmen. These kids are going right into the job force after this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Meredith, do you see hands? I see hands. 
Next is uh, Jeff Trapani. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thanks for listening us to us today. Um, my name is Jeff Trapani, uh, Riverside Drive in Florence, I'm president of the Northampton Soccer Club. Um, uh, most of our members are uh, residents, uh, children of residents, children that attend our schools. Um, and um, we offer children uh, um, opportunities to play in the fall and spring. Um, as, as Ms. O'Leary knows, we got about 225 kids out there this um, summer as soon as the restrictions were lifted. And we had a good summer and fall season where we played not only skills and drills, but then when it was opened up to more competitive play, we participated in roots and also gave our children the opportunity to play intramural for people that didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, to do that, we had very set rules in place. Uh, we had um, Google Sheets, the contact trace that we could produce on a moment's notice. Um, and we did not have any complaints about um, our operation, despite the high numbers and coordination that we had uh, to do that. Um, once the, um, at the end of our season, um, we were closed down with the November order, which I've looked for the order on online and haven't seen that any minutes reflecting that order and, and would ask the board to, to post that so that we can see that that was, that was done. But um, we, we adhered to that. Since then, many of our players have gone to play in other towns and cities um, in indoor leagues. Um, and so now we're gearing up for the spring season, uh, which will begin April 24th. We would need our kids out April 1st and we're registering kids now. Um, it has been slow to register kids. And we think that's a result of the fact that we are, Northampton is an outlier, as Ms. Morgan said earlier. Uh, we know of no other town in the Commonwealth that has um, decided not to adhere to the Commonwealth's um, regular restrictions, which allows for full mast play indoor or outdoor. And we're asking for full mast play outdoor as we did uh, this fall. Uh, we just wanna repeat what we did then. Um, we know of no transmissions, on-field transmissions. Um, I think other people can speak to the science of that, but by the time we get out on that field, our numbers will be the same as they were in October, which was before we shut down and when our kids were enjoying full soccer games. Um, we'd like to get all kids to be able to do all their activities, playing trumpets, playing horns and all that. We, all we can focus on is what we can control. We know outdoor mass soccer is safe, is a fantastic outlet for kids who are getting very little uh, social interaction. My wife is a therapist and deals with this constantly. And we offered that and we just want to do it again. And there's really no science that says that it's not safe to do that. Kids are playing indoor mass soccer at in Westfield with no issues right now. Um, so the ask is to let if us- If you could wind up your thoughts. I'll wind it up, yes. Thank you. The, the ask is to let us do exactly what the governor has said um, is safe for our children, ask us to be on par with other towns. The consequences of which will be our kids will go to other towns and play regardless, and we want to keep them safe here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Meredith, I see a few more hands. Welcome, Suzanne Smith. Meredith, can you hear me? I think Anthony is up next. Yeah. Meredith is muted. I was just unmuted, but Anthony was definitely next. Okay. Yeah. Anthony, you wanna go? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm glad I went after Jeff because he's the president of the Soccer Association. Um, <clears throat> my name is Anthony Peck. Um, I live in on uh, 9 Laurel Street, Northampton. And I have two kids in, uh, in the public schools here. Uh, uh, one's a high schooler, uh, hopefully running track this spring. And then I have a younger child, 11 year old, who uh, plays on the travel team for Northampton in the last year, last spring. And then this past, uh, this past fall uh, competed in the intramural uh, within town sort of uh, soccer practices that uh, the Northampton Soccer Club was running. Um, we decided not to do 
uh, indoor soccer this past winter um, because of COVID concerns, uh, but we are hoping to uh, re-engage with outdoor soccer this spring uh, as part of the travel team. Um, so I'm, a, I'm also an academic by training. I have a, I'm a professor of sociology at UMass and uh, have some experience in demography and some public health uh, background. Um, so I've been looking at the data and there's not a lot of data. You probably know the data better than I do. Um, but, uh, there's some, some news reporting about some of the contact tracing results. And again, I'm sure you have much better data about this. Um, but I was reading that in New York, um, New York, state of New York, they traced 1% um, of cases uh, in that state to sports. Um, but it appears a lot of it was tied to ho indoor hockey. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize it's more distinguished between the different sports, uh, whether or not they're indoors and outdoors, and also the different kinds of modifications that are in place. Um, I'm hoping that soccer is one of those sports that has low, um, <laughs> low transmission risk during play. There is some reporting in Massachusetts about um, soccer, uh, youth soccer and COVID transmission. Uh, but it turns out, I think it was the town of Dedham that, that was talking about this. A lot of their uh, contact tracing associated with youth soccer turned out to be social gatherings before or after play and not actually in-game transmission. So uh, to me, that suggests that you know, in some ways, uh, youth soccer might have gotten a little bit of a bad reputation for something that's it's not really part of the game, which is uh, like like everything. Social gatherings are are really the powerful spreader of this uh, this virus, and that the actual in, in game transmissions are pretty low. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth. Thank you. So um, I'm Elizabeth Schoenfeld. I am a, an emergency physician at Bay State Medical Center and also the vice chair of research there. And I would be happy to speak to the science. Um, and currently the science is, you guys know the numbers, they're dropping, which is wonderful. But more importantly, the question is, how do kids and adults spread? Um, and as Anthony said, you know, we have learned so much from last spring about how it is spread. Um, and one thing that we know is that we really have not seen any outdoor transmission. So when we look at our sports, particularly, and, and I'm also a soccer coach for nine-year-old boys. Um, so I'm speaking as an emergency physician who has seen how bad COVID could be, as a researcher who looks at the data every day because I want to help my hospital and our communities make the best decisions. And also as a parent who has watched these kids be inside, not get enough exercise and suffer the anxiety the lack of exercise, the last lack of social interactions that have been happening over the past year. Um, and I really appreciate everything that Rachel and Morgan and everyone has said, because all of the kids are feeling it, all right? So there is no data that there has been any spread from soccer, and there have been several good studies that have really tried to trace that. And then when you add on the fact that Northampton Soccer Club follows the CDC recommendations in terms of kids are washing hands right when they get there, we are staying six feet apart, water bottles are six feet apart when they take breaks, we're wearing masks, et cetera. There are CDC recommendations for how to do things properly um, and we are doing them. Um, and I think that um, as Jeff pointed out, if we don't have a soccer season, then all the kids in Northampton disperse and play soccer for other towns. And we can't guarantee that other towns are doing this better than we are. We did it well and we'll continue to do it well. And the risk of not having a soccer season is that each of our kids, rather than playing with each other, is now at all of the surrounding towns, playing with those towns and getting infections from those towns. If you, do you know what I mean? So I think that in terms of harm reduction, we wanna keep them together and we wanna do it right. And we have learned how to do it right. Um, there are CDC recommendations on how to do this, and I looked through them, and it was exactly what our club has done, um, and it is very, very doable. It involves masks, as we said, and hand washing and distancing. The last thing I want to touch on, something there was a nice New York Times article on COVID absolutism, which is if we make rules that don't make sense and don't follow the science, people don't follow other rules. We have to make rules that make sense and only those rules because otherwise we risk losing the confidence of the people around us. For example, UMass just told their students not to go outside, right? But that doesn't make any sense for the science. Kids need to go outside. The last thing I wanna point out is that we are balancing risks and benefits. The risks of COVID versus the risks of our kids being indoors. And I think we need to remember that that second risk is really substantial. And I am at my three minutes. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Liam, you're next. Hi, I'm uh, Liam McGough from Suffolk, and um, I'm representing uh, the football team. Um, I don't want to keep bombarding with the football stuff and saying the same stuff, but I've just noticed that there's uh, the towns around us have unbanned sports, and I'm a senior, and this is my last year before I go off to college or whatever. And I just want to say I really do appreciate you guys hearing us. And I I haven't played as long as the other guys, but I've been seeing a lot of commitment this year. And it's really become a brotherhood beside um, – I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous uh, – and uh, I thought you should hear it from me as the senior and not from, you know, the parents, because it's about us, of course. It's our football season. And, um, you know, I've been cooped up in my house and it's, it's, it's really weighing on us. Um, yeah, it's just, I just, I really hope you guys make the decision, the right one with us playing. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've been seeing my friends and they just, they just, they really want the season. And I know they're not talking as much as I would thought they would be, but um, I know it. And I wouldn't, I hope you guys wouldn't think I'm lying about that, but a lot of us want this. Um, thank you. Um, Thank you, Liam, for having the courage to come here tonight and speak. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you for letting me. Sarah, you're next. Hi there, I'm Sarah Heim. Um, I live on Florence Road. I am also with uh, NSC. I'm the vice president of NSC and I'm also the parent of seventh and ninth grade boys. And I just really briefly want to piggyback off what my colleagues have said already and what, especially what Elizabeth was saying about the cost benefit you know, weighing the costs and the benefits, I really think that the additional risk of mental, social, and the physical health of our kids is something we have to really think about, especially in light of all the data that the scientists and physicians are bringing to the table here today. But I just see it with my, my own children, but more largely with the community. And I think it's in the best interest of our kids, as well as therefore our community as a whole, um, to let them get out there and play safely like they did in the fall. Thank you for your time. Thank you Thank so you. much. I think I see one more hand. Karen. Is there a Karen? I took a hand down by accident. Karen just left. I don't see any other hands. Does anybody see any other hands up? All right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for public comment? Please raise your hand using your reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I don't see any other hands right now. So I think we will uh, close the public comment session for now. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate your time and uh, we really do appreciate hearing from you and, and knowing what's on your minds. And we, we really um, we'll take that to heart. Um, okay. I think we'll now open our um, Board of Health meeting. We now also have uh, Suzanne Smith with us. Um, and we'll dig into our agenda. Karen reports that she's here but didn't get unmuted. We don't see her. She says she is still muted. And that she's still here. Anybody see her? I see some in a box that says Karen's iPhone. But there's no hand up. So um... She sent a message. Oh, so she... there she is. Whoop, All right, there great. she is. Karen's iPhone. Meredith, you see it? 
Can I unmute her? No, I can't do it. Karen? Meredith, you're muted. And are you able to oh, unmute sorry. Karen? Sorry, I've unmuted Karen. I've asked her to unmute. I'm not sure. Karen, can you unmute yourself? You should be able to now. Karen, if you're listening, can you want to type in the chat? Are you able to unmute? Well, now she's muted. Now she's on mute. Oh, she's still muted. Karen, are you able to speak? I think we're going to have to move on, unfortunately. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you so much um, for coming and speaking. Um, unfortunately, this is not a back and forth session in this public comment session. Um, and this subject is not on our agenda for tonight. Um, but uh, we definitely have heard you. Um, so we, I think we're going to move on with our uh, the rest of our meeting. And uh, thank you. Karen, if you would like to provide us with um, your statement via email, please email it to me to m-o-l-e-a-r-y at northamptonma.gov and I'll be sure to get it to the board. And I thank you all for who submitted something via email, um, the videos, the um, the statements, they all went to the Board of Health and if they haven't read them, they will continue to read them over the next couple of days. Yep, so thank we you did. All for joining us. Mm -hmm. We did receive those. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, what's next on our agenda? I don't have the agenda in front of me. I've got to find it too. Okay. Well, we have minutes. Okay. We have. Um, Minutes from January and minutes from December. Um, I think there was a last minute uh, change on the January minutes. Does everybody have the latest versions? It should have been in your email. I have December. Let's do December first. Uh, does that, has everybody seen the December minutes? Yes. Any questions or comments? Yes, I have a few changes. Okay. Um, department updates and uh, Kelly, I can sh I can send these over to you. It's not very complicated, mm -hmm. so I can say them. Department updates. Uh, direct first sentence. Director O'Leary discussed the recent COVID nineteen data that were released instead of was. <laughs> uh, third paragraph. Director O'Leary said that a testing site was stood up, a proposed setup at Smith Vocational High School. Where is that? Oh. Third paragraph. Um, I think that's the way how that's the way Meredith says it, stood up. Oh, okay. It's a little expression. Yeah. Um, And then the last, the very end, last paragraph, uh, right before meeting closed, uh, individuals should be, last sentence, individuals should be wearing masks at all times, instead of yes. all the time. Yes. That's it on, for me on this. Any other comments on the minutes from December? Is there a move to accept the minutes as amended? I move to accept the minutes as amended. Is there a second? Second. Uh, can you guys unmute yourselves and we'll do a roll call? Um, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. 
Okay, December minutes are accepted. Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, and now we have January minutes. Uh, the latest version was sent out not very long ago. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to look at those. Updated minutes uh, from January. Um, were sent out by Kelly at 4:51. There was I can tell people what the what the change was from the last set um, is that there was an additional line that said Cynthia Swopis and Laurent Levy indicated that they would look at revising the Board of Health open position description and discuss it at the February meeting. Um, other than that, I think you got the previous version was what the rest of it is uh, says now. Um, any questions or comments about the January minutes? Um, anyone want to make a motion? Um, I move to accept the January minutes as amended by uh, in the light in the last version. Yep. I second it. Okay. All in favor? Roll call. Cynthia. Yes. Lauren. Yes. Suzanne. Yes. Joanne, yes. Thank you all very much. Okay, now you've got that agenda up. It's tiny though. Okay, it's a <laughs> guess what? It's a COVID 19 update. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I guess we'll start with testing. Um, so we, uh, the city of Northampton has been doing weekly testing. We uh, started the last week of December, knowing that we might have a holiday surge of cases. Um, so the mayor approved that we do testing twice a week. We offered it on Mondays to um, those people that were having difficulties finding testing. We offered it to our businesses that had workplace exposures happening. Um, we offered it um, uh, to our city employees on Monday, and then on Fridays, and excuse me, also on Mondays, we went to the congregate shelters and did testing there. And then on Fridays, we would go to all the schools and did on-site testing for staff and uh, faculty and uh, anyone who worked in the schools, any the public schools and Smith folk. So that's been happening routinely since the last week of um December. It's been a real successful and appreciated program, both from the public and from, um, you know, the, the municipal staff and all of the teachers. Um, my intention was to have this testing available until it was no longer needed. When we started it testing, it was really hard to find a test site. One of the mass got the spread sites and to get in within a reasonable about amount of time. To, so we wanted to support the state efforts and UMass what was happening there. Um, so we, you know, on average on a Monday, we'd get anywhere from 200 to three people going through our site. And then on Fridays, we would see about um, 150 or so tests through the school system. Those numbers have been dwindling, not just in Northampton, but at testing sites all around. The numbers of people getting tested have been dwindling, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that happening. So it was all, you know, I figured that we would get through our second surge. We'd be on the other side of it um, uh, come mid, mid to end February, and it looks like that's the direction that we're heading in, thankfully. So we'll probably discontinue the public testing um, at the senior center on Mondays come the first week of March. And then we'll continue as long as I have approval from the mayor to do the teacher state uh, testing because the schools are in the second phase of their hybrid plan and they're gonna be continuing to bring more teachers on site as they move forward through the plan, their hybrid plan. So I think, offering this service, service really kind of gives them another level of comfort and trust and just um, knowing that their fellow, you know, teachers don't have or possibly don't have COVID-19, just it, it makes them feel um, more secure in going back to the schools. So hopefully we can keep that going um, until 
I, I don't I don't see an end date with it, but until it's not needed any longer. So it's been going well. Our positivity rate through the program has been extremely low. It was more asymptomatic testing to capture disease before it was uh, present um, in, in your infection within an infectious period. Um, so to curb any type of spreading. So um, the positivity rate again was extremely low, which was great. I think the most beneficial part of the testing pro program was once there was a, um, an event happening in a workplace, especially in the kitchens, like in our restaurants, there's such, such small areas and people working in there really can't keep that six foot distance. Um, to be able to provide immediate testing um, to these employees once there were, an event was happening, we really saw a benefit and they were at, you know, was, we, we were better able to contain any type of, um, sorry, uh, any type of spread within the workplace, getting people tested right away. Again, especially when testing was at a premium. So, Anyways, that's coming to an end. Um, with that, it's kind of timely because we're ramping up our vaccinate, vaccination efforts. This has been an extreme roller coaster ride, to say the least. And just when I think it can't get worse, it happens to get worse, um, which is frustrating. And not just frustrating for me, but it's frustrating for the public. It's everybody is completely frustrated about how this is rolling out. Um, we, we stood up a vaccination, just to kind of refresh your memories. Um, we stood up a vaccination clinic back on uh, January 11th was our first date to support the state's efforts. And we vaccinated the first responders. The state then gave local health departments um, who were holding clinics, standing up clinics, an opportunity to continue vaccination efforts as long as they committed to vaccinating through phase three. So I talked to my team. We knew it was a heavy lift, but we knew we could do the work and um, we're obligated to do the work as being one of the larger communities in Hampshire County. We wanted to be able to provide this service to all of our smaller hill towns and communities that don't have the infrastructure and couldn't do this alone. So we committed all the way through um, phase three and throughout this process, we have been fine tuning, troubleshooting, planning, um, crying, sweating, not sleeping and ramping up efforts. Um, you know, the first responder week was fairly easy and we took it for granted, even though there was a lot of kinks to work out, we kind of call it our pilot program. And we got through it and then we started doing the elderly and we quickly learned how we had to pivot a bit to accommodate um, for that population. And it's, you know, there's this huge learning curve that comes with it. And then we started with Moderna vaccines and then had to switch to Pfizer vaccines with which comes a whole nother learning curve. So we've been able to adapt and adjust. And I thank my team from the bottom of my heart because um, when I tell you we have sleepless days and nights, we do. Um, my core team on average last week uh, worked over 90 hours each. I, it's unbelievable what they are doing for me and for the public. And it's, it's a mission and they all have taken it to the heart and want to see it through. So kudos to them. Um, so long story short, um, you know, I think it was exactly a month ago at our last meeting when we got the rug pulled out from underneath us and I was almost in tears. Um, the state had told me that, um, we were not going to be getting our vaccine allocation as requested. They were reducing us to a hundred vaccines a week, which really is nothing, um, in the grand scheme of things. So we advocated, we joined voice, forces with, you know, um, the delegates, uh, Senator Joe Comerford was an amazing advocate for us, uh, Lindsay, um, they all went to battle for us. We got approved in Northampton um, to do Pfizer and we started doing uh, 975 vaccines a week um, through the Pfizer allocations. And um, we, 
now have been balancing Moderna and Pfizer. And we just got through our last second doses of Moderna. So we'll be full Pfizer moving forward. So with moving forward, we knew very quickly starting next week, we're gonna be doing first doses of Pfizer and we're gonna be starting second doses of Pfizer. So that means about 2,400 doses a week that we're gonna to have to plan for and give out. So again, planning meetings, gearing up, getting ready for that. And then um, yesterday at nine o'clock in the morning, we learn an hour before the public does that it's being opened up to 65 and above and those who have two comorbidities and adult senior low-income housing. So we didn't get much warning on that. Um, and, and then an hour after that, I got a letter as the vaccine administrator for the uh, regional site that um, we need to meet some certain criteria in order to stay open. And that cri the criteria that they set forward was extremely disheartening because my immediate response is we can never meet that criteria. They were asking that our throughput be 700 in fact, 750, 750 vaccines a day, five days a week. And at this point, the maximum amount of vaccines we've given a day was 360. So I and and we're exhausted. So I couldn't imagine going from 360 60 vaccines a day to 750 vaccines a day. So after about um, two hours of letting this sink in um, and throwing myself a little pity party of getting the the rug pulled out from underneath me again. Um, we, I rallied my troops. They all had their pom-poms in hands and said, we can do this and we want to do this for you. So we had a planning meeting yesterday um, and we are able to meet the state requirements. So I just put in a proposal today, letting them know we can meet their state requirements and exceed what they're asking. So um, our plan includes five days a week, which is the minimum that you can do. Tuesday through Saturday, and our throughput will be 840 a day. So that's a seven hour clinic at 120 an hour. And then you got an add an hour before and two hours after to set up and then clean up because there's always extra doses that have to be handled because Pfizer is not always a five or six dose drop. So, so the mayor approved of this. We're open to the state, but we've never been just closed to Northampton or Hampshire County. We've never turned anyone away from anywhere that they came from. Um, so that was another standard that if you're going to be a regional site that you have to meet. And then I just met with Amherst town manager, Paul Bockelman and uh, Emma Dragon, who is the health director in Amherst. And they, they couldn't meet the standards. Um, and, and they let me know that the other day. But what I offered to the state was if they could be a satellite site of the Northampton Clinic under the auspice of Northampton Clinic. So it would be under our provider number. We would, a lot of what we do, um, we plan together for continuity. We just wanted, you know, the same infection control measures, a, a lot of similarities in our clinics. And we did that purposefully. Um, so I think it will be an easy, thing to, to, you know, um, for them to work kind of, not underneath me, because I'm not going to micromanage, I'm not going to be at their clinics, but um, to be a satellite of our clinic. So they're also going to operate five days a week, um, Monday through Saturday with Wednesdays off, but their throughput is going to be 250 a day. So this is what I proposed to DPH today. I'm hopeful that they'll approve this because not having a vaccine clinic in Hampshire County is a huge detriment to, to Western Mass, you know, excluding Hamden County. They're gonna have many sites in Hamden County, hopefully, um, but for Franklin, Berkshire and Hampshire County it would be a huge detriment. So that's where we're at with the clinics. To date, we've, we've given over 3000 vaccines locally. Um, that's huge. Um, you know, if you see what some of the mass vaccination sites are doing, I mean, I think they're not even quite up to 500 a day yet. So, um, 
we're we're holding our own here in little old Northampton, which is fantastic. So the clinics that we're running right now at 360 a day, tomorrow, uh, excuse me, Saturday is supposed to be our first 420 throughput, but um, we're not getting our vaccine. It was supposed to be delivered this week. Um, and I just got another notification from Pfizer that due to weather out in the West, Midwest, I'm not sure, we're not getting our vaccine for possibly Monday. So we're gonna have to cancel our Saturday clinic for 420 and our Monday clinic for 420. Um, but on average, what we have for staff and volunteers to run an eight hour clinic to have a throughput for 420, it takes almost 40 staff and volunteers to do this. It is a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. Um, and we have two command operators. We have one on the front end who's our operations manager. And that's either Lauren, myself, um, we're training another or two health directors to help support us when we have days off. And then I have a backup, Amy Hutchins, who is one of my new inspectors. She is, um, she's amazing. And I'm training her to also be operations side. And then we have a medical operations who right now it's just Kate Kelly. I'm trying to hire another. I, I would like to clone Kate Kelly, but I know <laughs> that's not possible quite yet. Um, but I need to hire someone who can do the medical operations side of it. Um, but I think we've got it figured out pretty well where it shouldn't be a problem. Um, you know, at the senior center, we've only been using um, five rooms. We, uh, I, I, I invite you all to come down and see our operation at some point. It's, it's pretty cool if you haven't done it already. Um, we've been only operating five rooms. We do four pods of five and each pod goes into um, a room and then they go into rotation. What we're going to do if we get approved to move forward is we're cleaning out all of the rooms in the senior center. We'll have 11 rooms in rotation eight will be used and then we'll have three as overflow and, and operate that way. Um, my two biggest fears about this is A, getting the vaccine. So again, if they approve us, will we have enough vaccine to be able to fill you know, the schedule that we're putting out there? That terrifies me. Um, I hate canceling appointments. And then the second is parking. It's not the best for parking, but we have no other location to move to. So it is what it is. I think we'll probably have conversations with um, the World War II Club across the street and perhaps the Gazette or something to see if we can use their parking lots um, as we move forward. So it's quite an operation. I've had this love-hate relationship with the clinic since the get-go. I love that we are getting the vaccine into people's arms and how happy we're making people and how safe we're making people feel. Love that aspect of it. Um, you know, the hate are all the nuances that are out of my control, meaning um, the vaccine distribution, meaning the state um, registration platform kerfuffles, um, as you I'm sure are all aware of that happened today, the, the state um, registration platform crashed about two o'clock this morning. And it's, uh, it, I got up and running about two o'clock today, but it's intermittent and it might come back on and then shut down again. Um, so, you know, dealing with those things that are out of our control um, infuriate me, but it is what it is. Um, it's just, it's like I said, it's been a roller coaster ride. You've, and, and just when I think we, we can't get any more disappointed that the state happens to do something that surpasses that, you know, like I thought when they pulled the vaccine away from the hospitals last week, I'm like, what's next? You know, it just, I've been asked, uh, Senator Comerford um, called me yesterday to see if I would speak at um, the hearings next week and just kind of tell my story, which I'm happy to share my story. Um, so people know what's happening, um, but that's kind of the update on vaccines. I just want to say that Meredith, that you've done an incredible job and the fact that you are fighting to keep this clinic open rather than being happy to have a little rest is still amazing. 
And board members, not for the public, but board members um, who haven't been over there, you really should go over and see that operation. Uh, Suzanne and I had the opportunity to go uh, a couple of weeks ago to uh, fill in some missing uh, medical people. And it's quite the smooth operation. And everyone I know who's been through there has been so happy with how it went. And it was efficient and smooth and friendly and local and, and uh, everything you could want. Um, and Kate Kelly and Vivian are just amazing. They're the nurses who run, run the ship over there. Um, they're just awesome. And the medics, I mean, the medics have just, they have stood up and they mm -hmm. are the ones that are doing most of the vaccine administration. We have one medic for every room and then we have two alternative medics helping with vaccine draw and uh, medical observation. Um, yeah, just, it's been a great, collaboration between us and the fire department. And as we move forward, we asked East Hampton if their medics could also help out. We have just contracted with Hilltown EMS too, because we know we're gonna need more medics because we're already starting to experience a little bit of the burnout. Um, so we're, we're getting you know um, things in place to just be able to expand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It would be awful if they didn't approve us. We have invested a lot of time, a lot of money in the stuff that we need to actually run the clinic. Um, it, it would be awfully sad. And um, just um, does the state support all of these costs? FEMA I mean, pays, personnel. Yep. Yes. So after January 21st, FEMA declared that they will pay for 100% of the vaccine efforts. So they won't pay for my nurse's time, regular time, but any overtime that they put in that is directly associated with the, the clinics, they will pay for. All, all the EMTs. All the EMTs, EMTs, yeah, the EMTs over time, exactly, is 100% paid for. Right. Mm -hmm. Ernest, um, when do you expect to hear from the state? So I don't know, honestly, Cynthia, I called um, Jana Ferguson, who is the assistant commissioner yesterday, because I didn't want to put any more effort into planning on moving forward. If I, I didn't even think we had a chance of getting approved. And she said to me, I would like to approve you. So I feel like that was enough. She couldn't say she could, obviously. I felt like that was enough to move forward. And then um, when I submitted my plan today, I just asked for some type of response on, you know, uh, when I would hear. Because effective March 1st, if you're not approved, you're not getting any more vaccine. You'll get your second doses and that's it. And Meredith, if, uh, if they approve you with Amherst as an ancillary site, um, would you be able to relax your totals a little bit so it's not so crazy for you? So... We thought of that, um, but we're not going to. <laughs> so you, you think you can handle it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I know we can handle it. Mm -hmm. okay. Given the right tools, we can handle it. Mm -hmm. Mary, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say it, it's an astonishing setup. It's, it's really unbelievable. I, I was stunned the entire time I was there. And what you're telling me telling us about um, yet more requirements and stipulations and regulations is so discouraging. Um, the states that have been successful are the ones that have, have eliminated barriers mm -hmm. to immunization. Mm -hmm. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what is motivating the state to take the opposite tack. But bless your heart for we're being able to operate within it and, and do such a phenomenal job. Mm, thank you. Meredith, that's, that was actually my question is, is there, what is the rationale about require, requiring that you increase your output to, to, to qualify as a site? So I, you know, honestly, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I do know a good percentage of our vaccines in the state are going to retail to pharmacies, and then they want more vaccine to go to the mass vaccination sites. And I think that works in communities like Worcester, um, where there's public transportation. I just, I think they really 
forget about the West side or they don't understand the geography of the West side. Um, you know, cause even if they, cause I know they're going to be setting up uh, another mass site in Chicopee, Holyoke Chicopee because, uh, and another one in Springfield, but they don't understand like people from Ashfield to still get from a, there's no public transportation to get there, but it's still an hour, 15 minute commute one way. Um, I'm not really sure. I, I, I imagine it's really difficult distributing vaccine to, you know, 200 vaccination sites and condensing them will make it a little more streamlined and I'm not sure. But, you know, the infuriating part to me is I've been in public health now for almost 17 years and all of these 17 years, what, what no, I was in Hamden, Berkshire and now Hampshire County, part of my job was emergency preparedness in some aspect. And all of this time, we spent oodles of money. The state, OPM, has given us oodles of money to write plans for pandemic, to drill and exercise these plans, and to be prepared to give out vaccines at emergency dispensing, dispensing sites if and when a pandemic ever happened. And for them now to not give it to the locals, to actually do what we're meant to do and pay these third party companies that are not in the business of public health or vaccination is just this huge slap in the face. Like you read the article today that CVS has been giving the wrong amount of vaccine to a whole swath of people. They don't even know how far this extends to. They're not in the business of vaccinations. You read about another vaccines, vaccination site um, becoming a possible super spreader of COVID because one of the vaccinators was positive and infectious and working. I mean, so, that stuff like is daggers in the heart. Like we know what we're doing. We know public health. And I, I told my team under no circumstances, if I think the integrity of our infection control plans are com compromised, we are stopping. Okay, I, I, I will not do that. I will not put the public or us in the position of something going bad. Stop, reevaluate, reassess, move forward, whatever that looks like. Um, so yeah, it's infuriating to me that DPH or the governor wants to give the vaccines to people who haven't been doing this for 17 years. So the letter from the state did say that they wanted to be more efficient and, and give more vaccine to their mass vaccination sites that had higher throughput. Um, but that doesn't really account for the pharmacies who I cannot imagine are high throughput sites. So it doesn't really all add up. And it doesn't <laughs> account for even the Eastfield Mall. You guys saw all those videos and read the stories about people standing outside for three and four hours. Yeah. I mean, you might have a higher thru throughput, but at what cost, you know? Here it is. Do you feel um, confident that our website can handle this? Our personal website? Mm -hmm. where, we, where people register through the city of Northampton. Yeah. It's just a link to the state site. That's all okay. I have to do is click a link. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yes. People have been complaining about the accessibility of it, et cetera, but it might be because we're in the middle of it crashing all the time. Right. Yeah. It, it's not our site. It is the state's um, platform that's crashing. It's not ours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meredith, is this in operation tomorrow or is the next? Are, are you are you vaccinated tomorrow or no? We are. It's a very small clinic. It's a second dose Moderna first responders. It's just the the sweep up clinic, we call it for those who couldn't make it in. Mm -hmm. If I stub by, am I going to be a burden? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. What, you, what won't time see it, you won't see it in full motion. Oh. <laughs> but yes, you can absolutely stop by. Mm -hmm. what, what are the times tomorrow? I will check and email you. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you still need help with? Vaccine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to run right out to my lab and get some. <laughs> Thank you. I knew you would, Suzanne. <laughs> 
I actually did uh, speak with the people at the hospital or connected with our representatives and got them to uh, <clears throat> uh, speak up on uh, your behalf. So I'm not sure how that all played out, but but it got it got sent up. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, Jeff reached out to me. Thank you, Joanne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll let you know, um, Suzanne. Right now, just advocating and supporting for what you know, vaccination clinics in Western Mass is the best thing that we can do. So, whoever you know, if you know people who know people who know people, just kind of getting that word out that it would that would be helpful. I was just starting to get used to signing people up. <laughs> 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 I did. I did a few. Yay! I, thank you. <laughs> well, I figured I needed to do that, but uh, I was amazed. I was amazed at how rapidly those lists were completed. It, um, if I was on a call, uh, by the time I came back, ten more people had been done. So it, it, it whoever I know, you have a team doing that, but uh, they're they're really quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that way two weeks ago. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I went as far as the video, and I have to say, the video was absolutely amazing. It was <laughs> detail, and just by watching it, I actually understood what needed to be done. Except by the and time we I had was no done. intentions on using that or sharing it. Um, it was just for internal use only. So it's really funny. I'm like, I need it. Can we just cut it? Because normally it was 45 minutes long, and so it ended up working, which is great. Um, so. so what, <laughs> Meredith, just yeah. to clarify, there are no vaccine appointments available for the near future. You're only doing the, the second doses and you don't know when you're getting your next shipment. Is that correct? We were supposed to do first doses on right. Saturday, but right. the last email I got, it said we possibly will not see that shipment until Monday afternoon. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Um, uh, another unintended consequence of the website crashing is um, the calls that came into the health department. So about six weeks ago, I had IT department. Um, we I dedicated a phone line and it was so busy. We needed an overflow to the voice message. So they put a 2000 overflow. That crashed. It didn't crash. That got full by like 10 or 11 o'clock this morning because people couldn't make their appointments. So then we had to open that up even further. The, the volume was insane today. And so I had um, the mayor do a robo call for me this afternoon to let, and, and people thought it was our fault and it wasn't, it, it's the state's fault. Um, but I had the mayor do a robo call. We put a message, an outgoing message on that machine to hopefully deter people from leaving messages because there's absolutely no way we can return all those phone calls of people complaining um, that they can't get through. And they were anxious and sad and in tears. And, you know, they've been waiting for this day to come and it's here and now they can't do anything. And you should hear some of these, these messages. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that's something that we had to deal with today. Uh, anything else? Any other updates you want to give us? Um, what else? Shelter. Is there anything else in this search? I the, see shelter uh, in the agenda. Oh, oh, okay. Um, why did I put, oh, so the shelter's been going well. It's at First Church, if you don't remember. Um, their capacity, their census is, I, oh, I don't know what it was today because I was supposed to have a meeting with them and I had to cancel. But last week it was 27. Um, they have capacity up to 33 and then they can take five and five or six more on cold nights, but they're not permanent beds. They just come in to sleep and then they leave in the morning. Um, we have been having weekly situational awareness, you know, update meetings and they've been going really well. Representative from the mayor's office is on that. ServiceNet is on it. Um, is there ongoing testing there? It's only for nope. new admissions or? Nope. Every week we brought the testing clinic to them, both to the Congregate Shelter and to Grove Street. So um, that's been really, really helpful because I think, you know, it was more of um, a burden to get people to our clinic. So it just, it worked out because they, you know, were walking to our clinic and then weather it just made it a little bit um, tricky. So You're using the um, the the um, the mobile unit. Mm -hmm. 
no, 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 we're not using a mobile event. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, we, the vendor that I'm using just brings their team to them and sets mm-hmm. up shop there. We don't mm-hmm. need a lot of space for testing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's been working out really well. And Dr. Bossy has been amazing. She's healthcare for the homeless um, out of Springfield, but Amherst and Northampton's in her catchment area. And she runs the resource center. So she got a list of people signed up who wanted to get vaccinated. And last Tuesday, I think we did 40 vaccines. Maybe um, 20 of them were at Mana's, And then the other were at the resource center. And she did a few, she took a few out in the road to to get some people that she knew that wanted it that were rough sleepers. And we will continue this partnership with her as long as we can get the vaccine, of course. So um, she can assist with that. She's just, she's a great human being. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to meet her. High energy, I mean, she exhausts me, um, but she is just (laughs) amazing to work with. She really is. So, and she cares. Um, Meredith, given the, uncertainty about the vaccine, when are you starting to schedule uh, vac- vaccinations again? I-, I get asked this a lot, so I'm just hoping that I can give people a frame of reference. So the, the scheduling is going to be really tricky now because we're going to yep. have to reschedule the Saturday clinic to probably two, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to work. It's a nightmare how I'm going to have to work this. Um, so you I- don't schedule until you have confirmation of your, of your doses? Like you put up new schedule like a week at a time. That's what we try to do. And mm-hmm. we got confirmation that we were approved. So we put the schedule up as soon as we got confirmation. And now it's it's a distribution thing. And um, I believe I already got approval for next week's doses too. So it's going to be complicated. Are people who are scheduled already uh, responsible for rescheduling themselves? No. Or will they get a call back? So this whole clinic that I'm going to have to cancel will just move to another date and they will, their spot is reserved. If they can't make that date in their email, they'll physically just have to hit a cancel button and reschedule. So they, if they can't make the date, that's the only way. The other thing that was supposed to happen with this new, um, uh, fate, not the phase, but the bullet under phase two opening up 65 and above was we had this wait list that was generated. So if you put yourself on the wait list through the website, which I know you guys helped with, or at least saw, um, we have everybody's email address and what was supposed to happen when the eligibility came through, everybody today in theory should have gotten an email with with links to clinics to sign up. But that didn't happen because we can't make the links to the clinic because the, the software, the platform, scheduling platform has been down all day. So it's just like this domino effect of things not happening. Um, So we're getting a lot of calls about that too. I don't know how you're doing it. (laughs) And yet she persists. (laughs) I I just have no idea how, and it's been a year now. It's not like this is a crisis that arose out of uh, some calm baseline. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a year ago today, I was getting off the plane, returning home from Thailand. Oh, Oh, that's right. Yeah, remember we had a board of health meeting. I'm like, no, I can make a board of health meeting. I'll be fine. I'm not going to be jet lagged. Five days later. (laughs) And you talked Uh about food sanitation in Thailand. Yeah. (laughs) And from that moment on, it has been full on 100% COVID. Mm-hmm. A full year. Uh, I had a question. There was a, a few weeks ago, I saw a new, newspaper, there was a fire under the South Street Bridge on, a, on one of the oh. camps. Was this, did this impact your operation or were they involved in any way with responding? Did it impact our... Did this create an, uh, a, an increase in... in in people seeking shelter. Some of the guests did come to, and it was just a temporary thing just to get out of the cold for a couple of days. So we did have a couple of the people, the rest sleepers come to our shelter. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's the proper term. That's the term that's used within the population. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're muted, Suzanne. We can't hear you. 
uh, what what was the term, Meredith? Rough sleepers. Say again. Rough sleepers. Oh, rough sleeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rough sleepers. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Kelly, can you put up our agenda again, please? Let's see what else we haven't covered. It was warming center. Oh, so the warming center. So um, which church, St. John's last week opened up a warming shelter and they're open every day except Tuesdays and Thursdays because the resource center is opened up. So this is fantastic. Um, I forget, I, I think it's like nine to four are their hours of operation. Um, and they provide, you know, it's a harm reduction shelter. They provide um, harm reduction coaches. I believe they've partnered with Tapestry Health to have the, uh, to have the mobile unit there a couple of times a week. They provide meals and electricity and water and it's just a, a great thing that's fi finally come to fruition. I know it's not a, a long-term solution. I know it's just COVID related, but I'm hoping that it's demonstrating the true need to have a more permanent resource center than just, you know, service nets two day a week resource center. People can take showers there and do their laundry there. And it's just fantastic. So. I think it's a good base model and something to build off of. And I'm hoping that some um, social service agency will, oh, Kelly shared her screen. Yep. Uh, Meredith, how are they doing uh, sort of the public health measures, distancing and all that? They, they, they provided us with a plan and we approved it. And then they're always in touch with us if they need supply sanitizer, we've been supporting with that. We've been supplying them with that. We've actually supplied them with an air purifier. So we're working together with them. They're running it. We're just providing any ancillary type of measures and opinions. Mm -hmm. So each person has their space. There's not congregating going on. No. Or? Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't been there myself. I will get there soon to see it for myself, but yep. I did see a little video of it the other day. It looks good. Okay. Um, thank you. Anything else in the updates? Any questions? Anything else? Um, then maybe we can move on to, um, it's not, well, our discussion was about redesigning power structures, but, but we're also related to the uh, job description. Um, thank you. It was Cynthia and Laurent who worked on the um, job description. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kelly, can you put that up, please? Do you have that? Um, so um, Cynthia or Lauren, can you tell us where you got this job description and, and you know, what, how, yeah, how, how you came up with this? I'm trying to think now who started, you started it, right, Lawrence? And then I moved in. I was about to say you started in, therefore you should speak first because I edited where you started. <laughs> you know, this was back in December. Yeah. <laughs> that was um, a long time ago. You've been through a lot since then. <laughs> I, I, um, I'm sorry. I just wasn't prepared for it. Other than I think, Meredith, you sent around something at one point or we pulled it off of our bylaws mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or something with, um, I, I just can't remember. There was a small blurb um, in the, I don't know, was it the city or the state rules? Yeah, but, maybe yeah. took a little bit off of MH, MAHB's site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I wish I was a little more articulate. Wasn't there, wasn't there something that Susan had forwarded also? Yes, that's true. Is Kel, are you there? I think she's looking for it probably. I could find it. Yeah, I have it too. I put, I just put it up on the screen. Is it not showing? No, we're still seeing the agenda. Oh. Um. How do you do one? You can't eat wood. Can let's try eat. again. No, you cannot. Oh. There you go. Oh, great. Thank you. Do you guys want to meet Finn again? He's adorable. 
Finnegan <laughs> O'Leary. We just got him last week. He has reduced my blood pressure by tenfold. <laughs> How old is he? At two and a half months. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. He's well accepted. <laughs> therapy dog. <laughs> um, well, this looked really good to me. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, I had two little questions, minor points. Um, one is the second line says volunteer board of health. The first line is a five member board, which works with the city government to maintain and improve the quality of life in Northampton. Is it general quality of life or is it, um, health? I, I have a suspicion that that bit, the first paragraph mm. was the part that w that came initially and that we didn't touch, but yeah, that, is that correct, Cynthia? Yeah, I think so. But where did it come from? That's what I'm, I'm trying it to- came, That comes came right out of the MHB. Yeah, that comes right off MHB. That's okay, their, okay. So that's, that's where their we started. Mission statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that term health is starting to get stretched a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know what's politically correct or how we want to view ourselves. Let me just say Well, that. quality of life, I think, is even bigger than health, oh, yeah. even oh, yeah. though health can be so broad. Absolutely. Um, and we are called the Board of Health. So it seems yeah. to me to make sense to improve, maintain and improve health yeah. in Northampton. That's just, I don't know. Um, because quality of life could be like everything. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. I mean, economics, um, but then some everything. would argue health is economics too, so. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then in the third section, um, there's, um, Kelly, could you scroll up a little bit, please? Or scroll down. Um, in the third section, it says, um, Oh, it says the second uh, line says that um, designed to protect the health of residents. I thought we could say protect and promote the health of which, residents. Which paragraph is this? It's the second line of the last section. Uh, Re last under paragraph. reporting structure. Oh, yes. Designed to protect. So to what were you thinking? Protect and promote instead yep. of just protect. Um, but those are the only things that I had to say. I guess the the one more comment would be, you know, in our discussion of diversity, of encouraging diversity, do we want to have any mention of that or make it look more appealing to people who may not have a background in public health? It said, you know, especially people with a background in public health, which might be limiting. Um, yeah, again, if I can just, um, the purpose of this yep. was to attract people to the board, is it not? I think it's so. It's the job yeah. description for the yeah. Board of Health. And yeah. I think what we're forgetting to include in here, or I didn't see it when I was reading this really quickly, was you know talking a little bit about health equity and serving the populations that are underserved. And I don't, I mean, I know that in this broad language, it's implied, but that's because we we know that. But I think for the general general population, it might not be so clear. That's a good point. Yeah, I think, um, boy, you know what I, I recall now, um, I'm not trying to get out of anything. That was the night somebody came. Was it Sarah? Sarah Bankert, yeah. And I had this terrible internet connection Oh. And I remember contacting Lauren afterwards and said, what did I just volunteer for? Because I, I didn't hear the meeting properly. <laughs> but I remember there was a sentence in there. And, and Lauren, did you take that out? Because um, in the editing about marginalized I, populations? I have to look at the edits that I made. I, I, yeah. must, I probably saved it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take a look and reinsert language that's a little bit... Um, that that makes that clear because it's true as I read this now. Yeah. It it feels that we've taken <laughs> there is no language to what we initially had in mind. 
Exactly. Oh, actually, there is a sentence there that says applicants from underrepresented groups are encouraged to apply. Oh, I see. I see. I so that was the that. yeah, that was the change. I think I had marginalized, and I think um, Lawrence, you put underrepresented. But what I um, think Meredith is touching upon is um, the the concept of health equity in serving population that is underserved is 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 also uh, an important one because we're not saying. We, we basically saying we, 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 you may identify with this. There is a mission that is a mission of justice. So you don't necessarily need just to be a, a yeah. health professional interested in, in, in health matter in general. You also need to be interested. You, if you're interested in justice, that might be a, a, a job for you. That's essentially, I believe that's what you're saying. And maybe we're yeah. not saying this. I, I mean, we, we, perhaps it deserves a couple more sentences to, to emphasize that. Yeah. And yeah, it also the um, it says that we welcome applicants with a strong background in public health who are committed to serving the residents, visitors, and visitors. Uh, those who work in Northampton, I'm wondering if we could broaden that a little bit, and because for people who don't have a public health background, might be shy about applying um, with that language. I I thought I tried to look at this from the perspective of someone who wasn't that familiar with public health but had interest in, in the community. And I thought that this was an intimidating description for someone who, who didn't have a background in public health. Um, and I don't know if that's who we're trying to attract. Um, uh, I think that I recall from Sarah's discussion that um, part of the work that we as a community need to do is bring people up and expose them to new opportunities and give them opportunities to learn and, and um, participate at not necessarily a professional level at the get-go. Um, so I think we need to make a decision about whether we are really targeting people that know public health and know the nuances of, of these terms and, and what they mean, or are we trying to broaden this to the general community and hope that we can get people that might not have a public health background, but might be interested in participating in a committee that uh, has, I think the term is actually health related quality of life as its, um, as its central mission. I almost feel like, well, you owe it to talk about, about the board, who is the board, that's great, and duties of the board, but I think it should be under qualification. Honestly, it should just be um, residency of Northampton. Like we are open to everyone and anyone. We want people with different backgrounds to apply. I think this is really, I, I think you use the right word, intimidating, you know? I, I, I see it like our medical reserve corps, like people with non-medical, backgrounds don't even tend to um, look or, you know, um, dig further into who we are and what we do and apply because just that word alone, the title of it is intimidating and um, they feel that they're not qualified for it. Why? Um, we have not asked Sarah to look at this at this point, right? I no. think it's, I think uh, yeah. giving her this and helping us restructure it a little bit to make it a little more appealing to the masses. Um, I feel that she would like jump at the opportunity to help us with this. It, you know, at the same time, I mean, you're bringing up a good point because my city councilor asked me, Karen Foster asked me about um, someone who she knew was sort of interested and said, do you have to be a doctor? Right. And have we ever had that conversation that the board needs to have that type of an individual. We have to have one doctor by Mass General Law. By Mass General Law, okay. Yeah. I didn't so, even know that. Yeah, so um, that's important to remember because uh -huh. then it does open the door for you know, a little more freedom, so to mm -hmm. speak. Yeah, so, maybe we could have a section in here about qualifications and really broaden, make that really nice and broad. Or historically, the board has been made up of, you know. Um, so, um, well, can I propose, Lauren? Do you do you and I want to take another stab at it, based on yes, now that I our think, memories I have think been jogged? Based on what I heard, I, I took some notes as we were speaking on the on the draft. So I can take another pass, sending to you. 
Okay. And, and then we, it, it, it will be once it's back to you. So I can do this over the weekend, send it to you. Hopefully next week, Meredith has it. Okay. Um, or do you want to just take a, make a draft of your best shot and then Sarah, send it to Sarah Bankert and then yes. we'll have it for our next meeting. If that works. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions. Is, I, I realize, Mary, this is it's really busy, but have you had any inquiries about the opening or nothing really? We had uh, one or two, mm, not recent, but maybe um, late fall. And I asked the mayor if it was okay to operate with a four member board because I just, I didn't feel like we were at a point where we could bring someone on. Uh, so it was, he just said, okay. Back back in the, maybe just, it must have been over the summer. I, I had advertised it on Facebook. It was one person who seemed to be interested and then she didn't follow through. Okay. Um, and and um, could, it, could it be COVID? <laughs> well, there was this and also, I, I think we, 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 we had another discussion following um, what happened over the summer. Um, and, and, and the, the need for racial equity. And I think that opened a little bit our thinking about um, how to, who, who this position should go to on the basis of that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, well, I think the next step would be simply to, I, I'm happy to take a pass, send it to Cynthia and then um, from that on, send it to, who should be sending it to Sarah? Should it come from you, Meredith, or do you are you yeah. so busy that we should yeah, do this do directly? Not a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ask her if she'd will be willing to review it and and give her suggestions. Yeah, yeah, that would okay. be awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for doing that, Cynthia. Now, as, as if you don't have a lot, anything else on your plate, and Lauren well, and Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> Lauren thank too. you. Yep. Sorry for memory lapses. <laughs> Yeah, we've all been through a lot uh, in the last few months. Um, and I think that's all that was on our agenda. I just want to ask uh, Meredith um, how you want to proceed with the issues at hand um, regarding uh, issues that came up in the comments tonight yeah. other than sports. It's on my um, to-do list to review all of the orders that I have passed um, since March. And I've made some amendments and rescinded some through time, but I think it's time to look at these again, especially as um, the cases are going down. Um, so I, I can, unless you want to have input, I would, you know, if I felt like we were at a time and we could lift the order or partial of that order, um, I could do it under the executive power that you gave to me, but I really want to take a deeper dive into the data, the local data, you know, county data and state data in terms of clusters and what they're seeing right now, because um, that's how the order came about in the first place. So um, I'd be happy to do and start with that one since it's kind of pressing because the season is upon us. Yeah. Um, I can do that next week. I'll, I'll put it into my, my calendar. And if I feel uncertain of anything, um, you know, I'll reach out to you, Joanne, first. And if we had to, we could have, you know, um, uh, we a meeting. Could, mm -hmm. yeah, we could have an emergency meeting in between, but I don't think we'll, it'll come to that. Okay. I'd also you, you encourage you to look at the sports. I mean, I do think that all sports are not equal and indoors and outdoors mm -hmm. are not equal and, mm -hmm. and to, uh, consider them individually. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there have in fact been numerous outbreaks among football teams. So I, I think that that, I mean, that's well known in college and pros. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There have, there have been new, many of them Te games had to be canceled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's uh, something where there is in fact data. Right now, um, well, I think it, it's probably the data is two weeks old, but the last time I looked, the largest activity type of cluster was basketball. And again, that's an indoor close contact sport. So, um, you know, for the general public who are still on here today, these, um, these orders aren't written without, you know, science and data and, you know, something behind them. Um, and that's the way that they get lifted also. I, I feel great confidence in, in, having you use the executive powers to, to 
you know, on an ongoing basis to lighten or tighten these restrictions as you see fit, especially as they fit in with, with the whole array of restrictions, because you're the one that has, has the knowledge about what all is out there mm -hmm. currently. Um, and to make sure that, I know you're making sure you have a balanced approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Would you uh, comment on the, I, I think that argument came a couple of times is the issue of um, the, the comparison that was made with other communities. To, to what extent is that true? We've always been, oh, you know, it's extremely true. We've always been progressive in Northampton and more than not, the communities follow our lead. They did it right from the get-go of COVID. They've done it with tobacco. We make regulations, they we test the waters and then people, you know, other communities tend to follow. We have, you know this as well as the rest of the board members, we have 351 boards of health in Massachusetts and they all have autonomy and are allowed to make stricter restrictions and regulations than the state and federal government. Um, and that's what we tend to do based, that's usually evidence-based. There were some early COVID that weren't so much evidence-based. I remember the mask regulation that we made, it was, well, it can't hurt, but <laughs> you know, um, that's what we do. Um, so I, I know there's other communities not so much here in Western Mass. There were many in Eastern Mass that had similar orders as ours. So it wasn't the only unique Massachusetts community that had stricter requirements than Governor Baker's. Mm -hmm. Fear-based measures have their moments. Mm -hmm. In the absence <laughs> of, of data, fear, fear is a factor to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a gut feeling. <laughs> and I wonder if um, if there are thoughts about um, opening sports up about having some kind of COVID compliance officer or having somebody on who's at these sporting events uh, be responsible that the rules are followed, that people are wearing masks, that they're six feet apart, I mean, that all the general rules are being and there followed. Is. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll still, even if the order is lifted, there'll be some type of order left in place that we review those plans prior mm -hmm. to commencement of the sport or the activity. And they'll have to identify someone within the league who is going to ensure that all of these uh, public health measures that they've written into the plan are being um, monitored and enforced. Do we have any, uh, do we have the person power to uh, do spot checks? Um, right now, no, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we will. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions, thoughts or questions? Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. I have a question for you. Oh, wait, did you? We need a I roll call. Roll call, roll call. Are we adjourning? Um, all in favor, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Lauren? Yes. Chris, uh, Suzanne? Chris or Suzanne, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your name's yes. up as Chris. And yes, Joanne. I know, I know, I, I, uh, I know. Yes, uh, we uh, will now adjourn. Uh, unless Meredith, you want to have your your statements on the record? No, no. Okay, well, we are now adjourned at seven oh seven. Thank you, everyone.